Good evening and welcome again to Science Week. My name is Nick Keefe, I'm the Executive Dean of the School of Science and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Hilary Downs from the Earth Science Department. But first, the commercial advertisements for the rest of Science Week. At 7 o'clock tonight, there is a, a talk by Rick Cooper from Psychological Sciences on the complexities of routine behaviour. Between the two lectures, there is Drinks and Nibbles in BO2, which is just further down the corridor and on the right. You, you don't have to go to both lectures to go to the Drinks and Nibbles. The other scientists can come and ha have a drink, but we will be hearing them away at 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and is one of our most distinguished geologists, and she's going to tell you about what can asteroids tell us about the Earth. Hello. Thanks, Nick. Well, it's a great pleasure to uh, give a Science uh, Week talk. I've not done this before, despite having been in the uh, university for many years. My topic tonight is to ask, what can asteroids tell us about the Earth? And here, is a picture of an asteroid, which uh, you'll notice, remember that asteroids are always described as being potato-shaped, which means they don't really have any particular shape at all, although they do tend to uh, sort of be long and thin, or uh, uh, certainly irregular shape. And then we see the Earth, which is, of course, a, a, a much larger object, and um, it's a much more complex thing. So how, what can these funny asteroid things tell us about the Earth, is the question that I hope to answer. Now, I love these artists' impressions of the early solar system. You can see here the, uh, the nascent sun. The sun is starting to shine. Comets are falling into the sun. More comets are coming through here. Uh, there's a planet forming here with, uh, with a, a ring of dust around it, and there's a couple of smaller bodies, planetesimals, uh, hitting, uh, colliding with each other and uh, forming a... Um, well, could form anything because uh, there's a lot of different outcomes you can get from collisions like this. Uh, in fact, we think that the Earth and Moon system were formed in a collision that was between two very large planetary uh, embryos. Okay, so uh, in all this, we, or from all this chaos and uh, collision, uh, emerged the solar system as we know it. Um, and asteroids are part of the solar system. Um, they're bits that were left over from the early part of the solar system, the uh, very early history of the solar system. And these lumps of rock, which is what they are, preserve some information from the very distant past, from the beginning of the solar system, as I hope I will uh, show you. So here's a, a, a mock-up, of course, of a uh, piece of rock heading for the Earth and uh, about to uh, bring its message to us. A reminder for those of you who um, may not remember from the, your uh, science studies before, where the asteroid belt is. So this is the sun in the middle of the uh, solar system, the center, uh, and our four, uh, what we call the terrestrial planets, that's uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then there's a ring here, which is the main asteroid belt. That's many, many tiny fragments of uh, material. And they're kept in this um, general area because of the effect of the gravity of Jupiter. Here's Jupiter, the, the largest of the planets, and it's the uh, gravitational effect of Jupiter that has um, caused the formation of this asteroid belt. It's basically uh, prevented a planet forming here from the material that might have been here uh, originally in the early days of the solar system. Uh, Jupiter actually has some of its own asteroids that form in, uh, out here and here, uh, but what I'm really going to be talking about is material from the main asteroid belt, and particularly the material that crosses over our um, Earth, the orbit of the Earth here, because it's uh, it's not exactly easy to go and get pieces of um, asteroid. Uh, but, in fact, that has been done on one or two missions, and I'll explain that. So, just to put uh, an old chestnut, uh, to, to, uh, just to 
say that this is not true. The, the rocks in the asteroid belt are not the remains of a disrupted planet. A lot of people seem to think uh, that that's the case. It must be in some old dictionary or encyclopedia somewhere. It's not the remains of a disrupted planet. It's the material that didn't grow into a planet. However, there are some small bodies in the asteroid belt um, which, are, uh, which grew sufficiently large um, to look like very small planets, and I'll explain those in a minute. So this is a close-up of several asteroids. Now, they're not this close together in the asteroid belt, okay? Um, the, 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 the movies where you see people flying their spaceships through the asteroid belt are completely erroneous. Um, you probably would fly through it without noticing that you'd flown through an asteroid belt. Um, but there are a variety of these lovely potato-shaped um, objects out there, and you see that they are very old. We know they're very old because they're saturated with craters. They have lots and lots of impact craters on the surface. These are not volcanic craters. These are impact craters. Uh, and this is a fuzzy uh, picture, but it shows you the, the same sort of thing of a more uh, distant object. So spacecraft have actually visited asteroids, and they've sent a lot of images back. In fact, most of these are images from spacecraft. This is one from a, an Earth-based telescope. And even they've brought back a few small pieces of asteroid. And the one um, successful mission that's brought back a piece of an asteroid was the Japanese mission, which they called Hayabusa. Uh, if you Google Hayabusa, you, you get a lot of information about uh, Japanese motorcycles, because I gather it's a very common type of Japanese motorcycle, but it means hawk, and they decided to call their spacecraft hawk, uh, and it visited an asteroid which is called Itakawa, and the idea was that this spacecraft would touch down and jump off again immediately, and as it touched down, it would grab some of the surface of the asteroid. Very exciting space mission. Didn't quite work the way it was supposed to, but um, they did because the grabbing bit didn't work terribly well. So they were left with rather a, f uh, a small an amount of sample than they thought they were going to get, but they did bring back a few small um, grains which have been analysed. Another mission which is not bringing back any material but is visiting two of the biggest and most interesting asteroids is NASA's Dawn mission. And um, Dawn, the spacecraft, looks pretty much like... Uh, Hayabusa, doesn't it? Um, it went into orbit around one of the most interesting asteroids, Vesta. Uh, and it went there in 2011, and it's now left uh, Vesta, having orbited to, uh, Vesta for a very, uh, well, several, uh, nearly 400 days. And now it's uh, moving on, it's on its trajectory to uh, the uh, largest um, asteroid, Ceres. Now, why did it decide to, why did, it didn't decide, why did they, why did NASA decide to send uh, a, 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 a spacecraft to these two asteroids? Because th the reason is they are very big and they are very different. Um, Dawn has orbited Vesta and it has shown us uh, a great deal of uh, information about Vesta and it has particularly shown us uh, that Vesta is a differentiated planet, or planet uh, asteroid. In other words, it's got a core, a mantle, and a crust, whereas Ceres doesn't have that, that structure to it. At least we don't think so. We haven't got there yet, but we, we think it doesn't have that structure. So they're two very different kinds of asteroid. Now, it turns out that some asteroids actually cross the orbits of Earth and Mars, and this is a, a very similar diagram that you, you're Hiding in here is the orbit of Mars in orange, and in blue is the orbit of the Earth. In yellow is the orbit of Jupiter. So here's our friends again, the, uh, the um, asteroid belt. But these, all these big loops here are the orbits of asteroids that actually cross the orbit of Mars and the Earth. And if it crosses our orbit, it could eventually uh, arrive on one or other of those bodies. Now, many of you, I'm sure, will remember in February of last year, we had this uh, thing happening in Chelyabinsk. And this is a picture uh, taken by somebody's camera in the front of his car. There's a car in front of him, and the sky lit up with uh, a meteorite that uh, came to us from the asteroid belt. It finally crossed 
the Earth's orbit, and it finally arrived on the surface of the Earth. And before that, in 2008, there was an earlier Earth-crossing asteroid that had been detected, and when they did the calculations to see you know, how close it was going to come to the Earth, they discovered it was going to, become to, the Earth, come to the Earth very close. In fact, they had a, uh, it was going to hit the Earth. And they actually calculated this asteroid, which goes by the catchy name of 2008 TC3. Um, they calculated that it would hit the Earth, and they um, calculated where it would hit, uh, but they thought it was probably going to um, largely burn up in the atmosphere. And in fact, it did. It burned up and it broke up high in the atmosphere, but 600 pieces of it fell to the Earth. And those are 600 new meteorites, which uh, were uh, people from where, uh, the uh, area where it landed, which was in northern Sudan, people from the university in Khartoum organized themselves to go and look for meteorites in the area where... Uh, it had been predicted they would arrive, and indeed, they found lots of meteorites, 300 or so meteorites. So this is the kind of thing that you would be looking for if you were walking around in a desert. Uh, you suddenly see a very unusual rock. It's almost always covered with a black fusion crust, uh, and they stand out from the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the desert. And uh, so people who'd never even collected a meteorite before from, um, from the university in Sudan uh, in fact, it was lots and lots of students, of course, who were put in buses and bussed out to the area to, uh, to look for these uh, fragments. So they found, uh, as I say, many, many examples of these rocks in Sudan. So we have two ways of looking at, well, three ways of looking at asteroids. We can look at asteroids from the Earth through telescopes. We can send uh, space vehicles there to orbit them and look at them, or even in the case of Hayabusa to bring little bits back. Or, if you don't have the money to send a spacecraft, and I'm afraid, you know, we don't, the, the UK doesn't have that sort of money, um, ESA just decided to cut the budget for a sample return mission called Marco Polo. Uh, so ESA, the European Space Agency, doesn't have the money. Um, so we have to make do with meteorites as being our uh, pieces of asteroid. I hope I've convinced you that meteorites are indeed pieces of the asteroid belt. And so when we study meteorites, we're studying pieces of the very earliest material that we can find in the solar system. Now, these, uh, this is the only diagram that looks vaguely scientific, okay? So don't panic. <laughs> this is the science bit, as they used to say on the uh, adverts. Um, we can use radioactive decay to work out the age of meteorites. And these are two separate uh, methods, co two completely different methods. Um, and they, in one case, we have an age of 4,552 million years. And in the other case, uh, we end up with 4,000, well, it's the same number, 4,550 million years. Uh, sorry, did I say million? Yes, I said million there. In this case, it's 4,550 million years or 4 billion years. Okay, so this is the age of the solar system. This is the age of the asteroids. This is the age of the solar system. And there's actually a point here, which is um, material from Earth, which plots on this line and tells us that actually the Earth is that age too. So it's the age of the Earth, the moon, Mars, all of the uh, meteorites from the asteroid belt. I have to say that very carefully because there are some meteorites that are much younger. And they come from either the moon or from Mars itself. So there are much younger meteorites than these ones I just showed you these radioactive decay diagrams for. But, they, but th those meteorites actually come from a, another planet that we know in the case of the moon, we know it's the moon because we've got bits back there that the astronauts brought back. And in the case of Mars, we've deduced uh, that, it's, that these rocks come from Mars. So I'm not going to talk about those. Um, that's a completely different subject uh, because they're not asteroids, they're planets. Um, but this is the kind of material that comes to us from um, asteroids. And I shall go through briefly telling you what they are made of. Um, 
Well, there's a traditional way of um, defining asteroids, uh, meteorites, and that is the classification is stony, in other words, it looks like a bit of a stone, uh, iron, in other words, it's composed of iron, and uh, stony iron, which is this rather pretty thing here, which I will explain in, uh, in a minute, uh, which is a mixture of the, the grey is iron, uh, metal, and the uh, yellow is, is a mineral called olivine. And that's a kind of mixture, and so they've called them stony irons. Now, this is, uh, as I say, a traditional classification. It's about as useful as if I asked you to go out into the car park and do a study of the cars in the car park. And you went out there with, and you made a study and you said, OK, uh, I found that there are 55% red cars, 40% uh, uh, black cars, and the rest are all the other colour cars. And I said, well, that's really helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, because you're basically not telling me anything. It'd be much more useful if you went out to the car park and made a study of which ones are sports cars, two-seaters, which ones are saloon cars, four or five-seaters, and which ones are uh, big people carriers, because at least I'd then you know, have some idea of what use these, things, these um, uh, cars are put to. So there's lots of different ways of classifying things, and this is not a very helpful classification. What we now think is a much better way to classify meteorites is according to the kind of asteroid they came from, their parent body, their parent asteroid. And here uh, is asteroid Vesta, and these pictures, this mosaic of pictures, uh, was taken by Dawn, the spacecraft, um, and this is a, uh, a map of the topography of um, Vesta, it's actually the South Pole, and um, one of the things that they immediately discovered uh, um, in the, the Dawn mission is that there are two absolutely enormous, what they call impact basins, on the sou southern hemisphere of Vesta. Um, one of them, the older one, is 400 kilometres in diameter, the uh, younger one is 500 kilometres in diameter. And this explains why Vesta is not a completely normal sphere or spheroid. It, it's actually slightly, um, well, it's, it's distinctly uh, squashed in its appearance. This is a picture of what we think is inside Vesta, and this is a, a picture of what we think goes on inside the Earth. Um, and it's colour-coded to suggest that there are layers inside Vesta, just as there are layers inside the Earth. Um, and we think that these basins were formed by giant impacts over a billion years ago. And uh, it's these giant impacts that has, first of all, put a lot of material from these impact basins all over the southern hemisphere of Vesta, but more excitingly, put many of those bits of Vesta into the asteroid belt and on a collision course with Earth. So it's pieces of the south part of Vesta that we think many of the meteorites that we look at come from. Not all of them, but a, a very large proportion seem to come from Vesta. And so if we think about meteorites by looking at their parent bodies, what we're interested in is, do our meteorites come from an asteroid like Vesta that has internal layering like the Earth, or does it come from a, uh, an asteroid like Ceres where there's really a lot less internal layering and uh, what we call differentiation. So this has rock and a bit of ice uh, and a bit of rock outside. That's Ceres. Now, obviously, an icy asteroid isn't going to make it very far. Um, oh, an icy meteorite's never going to make it very far. Uh, so we think that we probably don't have very many uh, meteorites from Ceres. Uh, which is another reason for going and having a, a close look at it. But what, we, what, what I'm interested in and what my colleagues in uh, Birkbeck and also my colleagues at the Natural History Museum and at Johnson Space Centre in uh, Houston, what we are mostly interested in are rocks, meteorites that come from layered planets layered asteroids that have differentiated into different layers, just like the Earth 
we have the, uh, the core of the Earth and the mantle of the Earth. I'll go into a bit more detail about that in a moment. Mars, we think, has a core and a mantle. Mercury has a core, which is very big compared to the rest of it, and a mantle. And the Moon has a very small core and a mantle. And if we went off the edge here, we could put a very small differentiated planet there, and it would be called Vesta. We ha think it has a core and a mantle. Now, some of the meteorites that we, many of the meteorites that we see coming to us from the asteroids don't have any s sign of coming from a layered asteroid. They come from one that's probably like Ceres, an undifferentiated, unlayered asteroid. Um, nevertheless, they're still very beautiful and very interesting objects. So this is a... Um, what would have in the past be called a stony meteorite. It's uh, now referred to as, as a, a, a chondritic meteorite. And inside it, there are all sorts of little um, spherical objects. And these things are some of the earliest material that we think was formed in the solar system. They're called chondrules, and they look like this, if you make a very thin section of them and shine light through them. And this is something that uh, students in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science would, um, I hope, recognize quite readily. Uh, this circular outline and these, uh, this, these textures inside here, um, these are the uh, interior of these little tiny drops of what was referred to as fiery rain by the first guy who ever saw them. First person who ever saw them was a, a British scientist called Henry Clifton Sorby. He's the first man who ever decided that it was a really interesting idea to cut a rock into a very thin slice and shine light through it. Heaven knows why he thought it was a good idea, but it's something that we do all the time. My students do this all the time now. We, we use. He looked at them with a microscope for the first time and he saw these things and he says, gosh, they look like they are drops, well, obviously frozen drops, of a fiery rain. And that's more or less what we think they, they are. He, his, his, his intuition uh, told him that they had once been molten, once been melted, and then they crystallized very, very rapidly, perhaps in, in an hour or two. Um, and how they melted is a uh, big uh, discussion big, uh, th there are lots of, dis uh, almost as many uh, theories about how these chondrules, these fiery rain droplets were formed as there are people who study them. Um, maybe they were formed somewhere near the sun and were thrown out and they were shocked by uh, shocks from the new sun and made uh, molten and then cooled again. There's all sorts of different uh, possibilities. Um, but certainly there was a lot of these things because we get thousands and thousands of uh, rocks that looked like this. I forgot to mention where you find meteor meteorites. Well, obviously you can go to northern Sudan and pick up some there. Um, but one of the places that NASA actually sends people to to collect meteorites and one of our um, colleagues Katie Joy has been twice on these expeditions, um, is to the Antarctic. So they send scientists to the Antarctic every Antarctic summer, when it's our winter, of course, um, and these people set up a camp on the ice and they look for meteorites that are found um, on the ice in very specific places where they think there will be an abundant uh, uh, amount of meteorites worth them going and collecting. And so they collect hundreds or even thousands of meteorites in a, in a, se in a single um, field season. Now that sounds amazing. The problem is that most of them are these chondritic meteorites and fairly ordinary chondrites, which actually the, the technical scientific name for these things is ordinary chondrites. <laughs> Uh, because they're so ordinary. So, uh, and they don't tell us very much about layered planets. Now, you may be wondering why, how we know that the Earth has got this layered uh, structure to it. 
uh, I borrowed this off uh, one of my UCL colleagues. Um, what we do is we look at the effect of the Earth on earthquake waves, seismic waves that pass through the Earth. First year students do this in, in Earth and planetary sciences, so uh, anybody who's done an Earth and planetary science degree, you, you don't have to listen to this bit. But we have an earthquake here, let's say, and some of the seismic energy just passes through the Earth's mantle, which is the silicate bit of the Earth, made of, of um, minerals, rocks that you would think, yes, that's a rock, you know, mainly uh, made of olivine and so on. Um, and then some of them pass through a thing called the outer core, which is actually liquid iron with a bit of nickel in it. And some of them fail to pass through the inner core. See, there's something there that looks like the inner core. OK, so the, we've got um, various different waves that come and go um, through, the, uh, through the Earth. And from this, we can determine the, when, when we've got enough information, we can determine that there is an inner core, a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, and it's actually the liquid outer core that the, uh, the, some of the waves don't pass through, and a solid mantle. So it's, it's a bit like a hard-boiled, no, it's a bit like a, a soft-boiled egg, yes? So you've got a, a, a hard inner core and a soft bit here, and then a hard bit here, and then the bit that we live on is called the crust, and that is so thin that you can barely see it on this, on, on this diagram. It really doesn't show up on a diagram of the whole Earth. So inner core, outer core, mantle, and tiny bit of crust. And the crust and the mantle of the Earth are made of the silicate rocks. And the outer core is liquid metal. And the inner core is freezing, as we speak, to solid metal. Now, don't worry, it's not going to freeze overnight. Although, if you go to some of the Hollywood blockbusters, you might think it, it does. Um, and I think you can probably guess where I'm going now about what bits of uh, meteorites come from which bits of Vesta. But just to see if you're right, let's have a look. So, our iron meteorites. These are composed of solid alloys of iron and nickel. And they are, we think, very, very similar to what the Earth's core would be like if we froze the whole thing. Okay, so we think these guys are essentially the Earth's core. Or, but they're not the Earth's core, of course, because the Earth is still a planet, hasn't been blown to pieces by an uh, impact. Uh, although, of course, we do get impacts on the surface of the Earth. Um, one of them is reputed to have uh, wiped out the dinosaurs, you'll recall. Um, but these must be the cores of small asteroids that were wiped out by <laughs> impact. In other words, they were broken apart and that mantle got removed. So the, the rocky bit got lost. And now what we've got left are the cores. We reckon we have the cores of more than 50 little asteroids, former little asteroids. Um, and what you can do with these, well, there's a lot of things you can do with them. I'm not going to go into all the details, but you can polish and etch these, these uh, metal alloys to bring out the hidden crystal structure inside them. And this hidden crystal structure tells us a great deal about the iron meteorites. It tells us, for example, how slowly they cooled inside that asteroid. And we can determine that they, because of the um, size of these, diff these uh, etched patterns, the, uh, we can, and, and looking at the chemistry very carefully, we can determine that these things cooled relatively slowly over a few million years inside their, their parent asteroid. So, cause of asteroids. And of course, Iron meteorites are the ones that most people think they would find if they went off on a meteorite hunting trip. But actually, they aren't particularly common uh, in terms of, the, of falling on the Earth. But they're quite common in terms of finding them because they stand out like a sore thumb because you don't get lumps of iron sitting around on the surface of the Earth normally. 
So um, they are overrepresented in our collections in places like the Natural History Museum. Um, and of course, they're a lot stronger than a piece of rock. They're not going to fall apart coming through the atmosphere. Remember the one that fell on Sudan, fell into 600 pieces, well, it probably fell into far more. We only collected 600 pieces. Uh, it fell into lots and lots of pieces because it was actually a very uh, friable bit of rock. It, wouldn't, it didn't stick together very well. It's probably what we'd call a conglomerate. Anyway, so this, this tells us what's going on or what used to go on many, many uh, 4.5 billion years ago in the core of a uh, small asteroid. Now, these are the, the rocks that are the, the most, I think they're very beautiful, but they're also um, extremely rare. And these are rocks that are clearly, these stony iron meteorites, are clearly a mixture of metal, which is the grey stuff or the slightly reflective, shiny, silvery stuff here. And it's very similar to the iron nickel metal that I just showed you in the previous picture, the metal of the uh, iron meteorites. And this yellow mineral shown in both of these is a typical mineral called olivine, which is exactly the mineral that we would anticipate to find in the mantle of a planet. If we go to the Earth, we find lots of bits of this kind of, uh, of this mineral. I'll show you those in a moment. So one explanation, it's not the only explanation, but one explanation of stony iron meteorites is that they are actually a, the boundary between the iron core of an old asteroid, an ancient asteroid, and the, the stony, the silicate mantle. Now, I said these were rare, but they're not that rare. I mean, you, you, we've got a you know, reasonable number of them in our collection, and it seems a little unlikely that they all represent this tiny volume of, a, of, of planets, of asteroids, uh, the, the core mantle boundary. So an alternative explanation is that this was actually um, the asteroid was hot enough that it was starting to separate, melt and starting to separate the metal into the core from the silicate um, mantle. And so th this is actually uh, a fossilized piece of, uh, a fossilized sample of differentiation going on in action, the metal and the silicate separating. Again, lots of discussions about that. Now, in Birkbeck, what we do, what we've been doing in my little group, is that we do research on samples from the core and mantle of a very ancient asteroid. These are some pictures of the kind of rocks we're looking at. And you can see that they're mostly, well, mostly rock, aren't they? But stony uh, material. And we're studying each, almost every one of these crystals here, these greenish, greenish yellow crystals, um, is a mineral called olivine, which my students are very familiar with. And we're studying these olivine-rich meteorites simply because they are made of the material that we think is extremely like the Earth's mantle. And for the first 20 odd years of my being in Birkbeck, um, I studied the Earth's mantle with my students. And then I thought, you know, it would be, we've got a data point of one here, the Earth's mantle. It'd be nice to see a mantle of another planet. Well, we haven't got a, a meteorite from the mantle of Mars yet. Uh, and we don't have one from the mantle of the, of the moon yet. Uh, but we do have these silicate, olivine-rich meteorites, which come from the mantle of an unknown asteroid, uh, which we are able with our friends from uh, NASA and from the uh, Natural History Museum here in London, we obtain samples and we look at them, we work on them uh, in the department. Now, these are pieces of the Earth's mantle, and I've selected ones that you can see the green olivine in them. Um, these are my evidence to you that the Earth has a 
a, a, a mantle that consists of largely olivine. The stuff around the edge is basalt, but the stuff in the middle is the olivine rich uh, material that we think makes up the Earth's mantle. And these are brought to the surface in volcanic eruptions. So you can go to, well, the classic places, the Canary Islands, Lanzarote. You can go to Lanzarote and you can pick these things up on the beach and they are pieces of the Earth's mantle. And my students do indeed go to Lanzarote and pick these up. <laughs> okay, now back to Henry Clifton Sorby and the microscope. So these are the uh, images or, uh, of this mineral olivine, which is the one in the bright colours, um, and other silicate minerals as well in these uh, slightly sort of less exciting whitish colours, but the pinks and the yellows and the purples are all the olivine. And these are thin sections, thin slices, through the meteorites that I showed you before, these, these kind of meteorites. OK. Um, now, the interesting thing about these meteorites, is, or well, there are many, many interesting things, but one of the interesting things is that they contain this black material, and all of them do. Um, and this black material, when you look, and you can't do this just in an ordinary microscope, you have to use an electron microscope, a scanning electron microscope, which we also own in the department and use. Um, it turns out when you do that, that you can find these are rims of carbon. So this is carbon and our old friend, iron nickel metal. And the carbon is not just any old carbon. It includes diamonds, tiny, but real diamonds. OK, this, on the other hand, are pictures, the same sort of pictures, thin section pictures, microscope. Um, but these are from the Earth's mantle. And the thing that I will, uh, particularly if we look at this one, I can assure you is that there are no diamonds in any of these rocks. In fact, there's very, very little carbon in any of these now. And there's no metal. And the reason for this is the Earth's metal has gone to the core. OK, it made our, our core. And the Earth's carbon is now in you and me and the forests and various other um, things that contain carbon. And there is a bit of carbon in the mantle, of course, because we find diamonds from the mantle. Uh, now, why did that not work? Ah, OK. Now, this is another of these thin sections, and it's much the same kind of field of view that I showed you in the previous uh, sections of meteorites, those guys. Um, but you, uh, you don't have to be a first-year student to figure out that something odd has happened to this. Uh, and the evidence in this rock for shock is very clear to somebody who looks at these things. If you this is a, a, a meteorite, just the same kind of meteorite that I was talking about. This is some of the black material around it, around the, the grains. But instead of showing those nice, pretty colours uh, of that olivine does in the, under the microscope, it's, uh, it looks like each of the olivine grains has um, turned into thousands of tiny fragments. And that's indeed what has happened. This has this rock representing the asteroid that we were talking about has been shocked, and it's been shocked by impact from another asteroid. And uh, the shock has produced these, um, what we call mosaic patterns. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but one day I slammed the door of my car as I was walking away from it, and I turned back to look at it, and the whole of the back window had broken into thousands of little fragments. That was shock. Yeah. Um, and this is what's happened to some parts of this asteroid on a large scale. It has been shocked so that things that were once solid objects like the, uh, the back window of my car have turned into these thousands and thousands of pieces. But instead of falling out like the back window of my car did, um, they've uh, remained 
intact, but uh, in, so intact that you can sort of see the grain, the big grain boundaries. The other thing that's happened is that the carbon in the meteorites has been shocked into graphite. Now I can't, uh, sorry, shocked from graphite into diamond. Now I can't really prove to you that these are diamonds, but this is a, a spectrum, uh, a Raman picture of uh, diamond, and diamonds are fluorescing there. Now don't go out and start buying rocks from eBay or uh, the meteorites from eBay because I can tell you these diamonds are very small. Okay, they are far smaller than even normal earth diamonds. Um, and they're small because they've been shocked. And um, we are studying, to some extent, studying the diamonds and the graphite, as well as the metal, as well as the silicate. So we're trying to, to, to cover everything in our studies. Um, now, I haven't, I've jumped on here to the core. We've, we've looked at the evidence for shock. I'm now going to look at the evidence that the material that we see in these meteorites actually has something to do with core compositions. Now, we see metal grains. This is a picture taken on our, our uh, scanning electron microscope, our microprobe. And uh, these, you don't have to worry about this, uh, except that these bright things here are the metals. OK, so anything in a, one of these gray, they're called backscatter electron images. Uh, if it's bright, it means it's almost certainly a metal. It's certainly something that's very uh, dense and very heavy. And we've analyzed these metals, and it turns out, this is another, I, I lied, I said there was only one diagram that had uh, data in it. This is the second diagram. Um, if we plot the amount of iron and nickel against the amount of silicon in here, in these metals, um, we get two little group co uh, compositions we found. One here, which is actually a mineral that we already know called sucite, uh, which has got 20% uh, silica in it and at 80% iron. And then we found a very strange uh, mineral here that we, we couldn't work out what this was. Um, it didn't make any sense to us as a mineral composition. Uh, the real known minerals are the ones that have got uh, sorry, diamonds here, and there's a diamond hiding under there, but there's no diamond hiding under there. So there is, this mineral doesn't exist. There is no mineral. It's, and we thought, well, that's very strange. And uh, one of my colleagues took this rock and went um, up to uh, uh, Glasgow University and she uh, put this small piece of metal, okay, so this is a tiny piece of metal now blown up to a size <laughs> um, that, that's quite uh, obvious to see. Um, and using a method called electron backscatter diffraction, she's indexed all of these pixels, if you like, as being either this mineral we already know, which is in red in this uh, diagram, so this mineral called sucite, which we already know, and a mixture mixed in with a mineral that we don't know, this green mineral, which we reckoned was something like um, a 10% uh, composition, 10% silica inside this, uh, this iron, and there's a lot of it. And if you look in the literature for what our friends, the geophysicists, and our friends, the cosmochemists, think is the most likely composition of the Earth's core. Oddly enough, they come up with this composition of about 91% iron and nickel and about 9% silicon. So we've, tongue in cheek, we're referring to this phase as coreite. It hasn't caught on yet, but we, <laughs> it will. And one of the other things, uh, as a s side issue from, uh, from this uh, corite material, um, the piece of core that we uh, analysed using electron backscatter diffraction, this one here, for example, um, sh also shows evidence of having experienced shock. Because you can take this under the electron backscatter diffraction, and uh, you can see, uh, using this method, which bits are in, if you like, uh, crystallographic continuity and which bits are completely opposite or different. So uh, this indicates to us um, that, that this piece of metal has been shocked as well as the silicate. So we can probably guess therefore that the metal was either in the asteroid before the impact or the metal came with the impactor 
and that's why it's shocked. So we, we're still working on that. In fact, we were discussing that this afternoon. Now, just to finish off, I mentioned the core, the core, the mantle, and I mentioned very briefly the crust. Well, the crust of most planets, terrestrial planets, is largely dominated by uh, rocks that look like this. These are typical basalts. Uh, and these are meteorites, they're not pieces of rock from our, our um, rock collection, because uh, they're actual re meteorites um, that have an effectively a, a, a basalt composition. Now you can go and buy, you know, get basalts anywhere uh, where uh, volcanoes are erupting on the Earth's surface today, or ma many places. And here's a couple of uh, you know, typical Wikipedia photographs um, showing the eruption of basaltic lava. Here it's uh, congealing and cooling. That's happening on the Earth today. Um, but on asteroids, this ceased 4.5 billion years ago because the asteroid lost all its heat and it cooled down and now, now can no longer produce um, this kind of volcanic activity to form a crust. But back then, at the beginning of the solar system, uh, lots of meteorites tell us that we did have basaltic crusts on asteroids. Probably the first crust of the Earth was basaltic too. We think that's true of Venus. We're pretty sure about Mercury and uh, we think Mars has also got a basaltic crust. So all of these terrestrial planets had this kind of volcanism going on it. And they one by one died out. So the first ones to die out were the asteroids, They're followed by the moon, um, followed by Mercury probably. The Earth is still a volcanically active planet because we're a big planet and we've got lots of heat inside us so we can keep pushing out basalt. Venus is also a volcanically active planet, at least we think so. We haven't actually seen an eruption on Venus yet, but people are definitely uh, aware that it could, that, that a volcanic eruption could occur on Venus. Um, and the volcanoes on Mars, the biggest volcano in the solar system, uh, Olympus Mons, again, we haven't seen it erupt, but it's, it's very likely that it has erupted in the last uh, few million years may sound like a long time to some of you, but to geologists, a few million years, ah, nothing. Blink of an eye. So our friend Henry Clifton Sorby would have loved to see these rocks. Uh, these are real uh, meteorites from the crust of Vesta, the, our, um, our favourite uh, asteroid. And this is what they look like under the microscope. OK, so those of you who've done a bit of geology will recognise some of these minerals, I'm sure. So I think it's about time I drew this to a close. Um, I hope you've got some questions. I think that looking at asteroids and looking, in fact, at other terrestrial planets, which is also things that happen in our department, we, uh, we have a big program of looking at uh, work or studying rocks from the moon, um, looking at how these asteroids and planets were formed and what they're made of because we actually have pieces of them, uh, that really helps us to understand our own planet better. And it helps us to understand, in a way, that our planet is unique. The Earth is unique in so many ways. Uh, that's a whole lecture in itself. You know, why is the Earth different from all the other planets? Uh, it's not just the heat, because we know Venus has got lots of heat and is producing lots of basalt. But it seems to be something to do with water. We have water on the Earth. Venus has no water, it's lost all its water. Mars had water in the beginning and has now lost its water. So all of the other terrestrial bodies, the, the planets and the, uh, and the asteroids, none of them have developed life as far as we know. But the Earth, with its abundant water, has uh, developed life. And so the next question, of course, is, well, where did the water come from? Because and, and our, it's difficult to answer that because we don't, I mean, we can't go into, the, into Antarctica and look for an icy meteorite. It wouldn't make sense at all. It would burn up in the air. If, if it ever came to the Earth, it would burn up anyway. Um, so the problem now is to try to obtain material that has interacted with water or even uh, actual ice itself. That, that's almost impossible, but certainly looking at rocks that have had water flowing through them.
is certainly uh, a, a next step in understanding uh, how, how terrestrial planets are formed and particularly why Earth is so different. OK, well, thank you very much. What about Europa? Um, OK, Europa has water on it, definitely. And a lot of the icy satellites in the outer solar system have water on them, yes. Whether they, we, we don't know if it's developed any form of life. The problem with Europa, of course, is it's very cold. And, you, and, and although you've got uh, water there, almost certainly water as a, as a subsurface ocean, um, it's very difficult to see what kind of chemical reactions would go on that would actually form life. Um, I think that's actually, we, we have a whole module in astrobiology, or half, you know, 15 credit thing, uh, in astrobiology. So um, I, I will refer you to my astrobiology colleague uh, to, uh, to answer that, but it is a very good question. We just simply don't know about uh, Europa, about life, and about uh, uh, how, what that water is. Very good question. Yes, they're, they're actually old meteorites that fell all over Antarctica, and then they have moved through the ice. As the ice moves, um, it moves downhill. <laughs> uh, gravity works the same down there as anywhere else. Um, but then it the ice comes up against a mountain range and ceases to move, because it can't, and it starts to ablate, it starts to melt a bit. And the meteorites then come to the surface and they're sitting there in the, um, on the surface, well, obviously there's some <laughs> under the surface as well, which you're never going to find. But the ones on the surface are, are if you like, sort of um, gathered together in these places. So there are specific locations in Antarctica which people think are the most likely ones that will yield meteorites. And so they go to these um, areas and, and they go to a different one they don't go to a different one every year. Sometimes they think they go back to the same one and have another look. But uh, certainly they, they, um, they are old meteorites. And we know that because you can actually, using another variety of radioactive dating, you can determine how long the meteorite has sat on the surface of the Earth. So, yes, we don't do any of that here. Um, but it's, it's, you know, for people who have been able to determine these things, you can determine very easily. Splendid question. No, <laughs> they all fell at all sorts of different times. Um, there are a few in specific places that, that appear to, ha to be a group that fell at the same time. And we think that that's you know, basically you have one asteroid, one little fragment of an asteroid that came through and broke up. And that would give you, so, so the ones in Sudan, for example, all of those will have exactly the same terrestrial age which was you know, eight, uh, the nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, about five, uh, six years. Um, but the, the ones in Antarctica are tens of thousands, uh, to, to thousands to tens of thousands of years old. Or they, when they arrived, they arrived tens of thousands of years ago, I should say. Yeah. But, but that, um, it's, so they've been sitting around on the surface of the Earth. And that is a problem because even in Antarctica, where it's horribly cold and very dry, even there, you start to get reactions going on between the meteorite and its external, uh, the ice that's around it. So the most pristine meteorites are the ones you've actually seen fall and people have run out and collected straight away. One of those happened 2001, I think, um, in northern Canada. It happened in winter and it came down and spread all over a, a frozen lake. And the Canadians, who presumably have nothing better to do in the winter, went out there on their skidoos and they collected all this stuff that had fallen. And they, because it was cold, they thought, oh, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea if we collected it in plastic bags and put it in our freezers and kept it cold? Which was a brilliant idea because that is, is the best way to preserve 
what was the, the, the material. And it turns out that that material is a very primitive kind of meteorite. And when you open the bags, you can smell um, what they call polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, tars and things like that. <coughs> so, yeah, that's, that was, you know, thank goodness that the Canadians had... Uh, Obviously, it wasn't hockey night in Canada at that time, <laughs> on, on at that time. Um, but yeah, they, they, that was a really great collection, as was the, the, Sudan, uh, the Sudanese uh, contribution. Oh, dear. <laughs> <coughs> I think that's you, sir. Uh, another <laughs> totally, I mean, I could talk about comets as well, uh, but not from personal experience, because I don't work on comets. Taking material, getting material from comets has been done. Um, <coughs> there was a, a, a mission uh, that went to a comet called Vilt 2, and it was called the Stardust mission, and it uh, flew through the tail of the comet and collected material in collectors, and those collectors came back to Earth, and people have been... Uh, well, some of that material has been curated and put away so that it can be worked on in future years if we develop better techniques and some of it was immediately worked on and the comet and of course we couldn't get any ice from there you can only get bits of uh, of minerals like olivine um, little bits of fragments of iron things like that that they found and that has completely revolutionized our understanding of of comets so you know it's absolutely uh yeah i'll, I'll say another a completely another uh, topic to talk about comets but yes we we do you know, we keep in touch with the comets and the literature about the comets because they're also part of the solar system they're also left over from the beginning of the solar system it's just that they come from so much further out um, they come from what we call beyond the uh, what we call the snow line which is the line a sort of hypothetical line at which ice would start to form, where it gets cold enough away from the sun or in the early part of the solar system, in the early days of the solar system, where ice would, water ice would form. So we don't think there was much water ice in the, in the inner part of the solar system, but there was lots of water ice in the outer part of the solar system represented by comets. And there is a school of thought. Uh, in, this, in this subject, there's almost as many um, theories as there are people putting forward the theories, but there is a school of thought that actually comets came to Earth, it brought, brought water to Earth. There's a whole other school of thoughts that say, nah, absolute rubbish, but, you know. <laughs> and that, that's why studying this kind of thing is so fun, because it's right, you know, things have changed. I couldn't have said all that before the Stardust mission. I would have had no knowledge about the Stardust mission, about material in the comet. Yes. Um, as far as I know, there is absolutely no truth. And the problem is, of course, that by the time the asteroid has landed on Earth, it's got lots of bacteria in it, because bacteria are crawling all over the Earth, including in Antarctica and in, in Sudan. Um, so it's very difficult to find, that, find out. Um, uh, but they certainly didn't find any bacteria in the, in the tiny samples that came back from um, uh, Itakawa asteroid the Japanese. Um, hopefully there will be more sample return missions to asteroids, even though Europe's pulled out. Um, there's still a, a, a chance of one um, going, uh, a NASA uh, uh, project, uh, going and bringing back a piece of an asteroid. And I'm sure that one of the things they will be looking for will be um, a lot of amino acids. I mean, meteorites are full of amino acids, um, building blocks of life. Uh, there's plenty of building blocks of life out there, but whether that's a far, far cry from having life. We're quite used to seeing information about uh, uh, lots of different kinds of amino acids that uh, were found, uh, particularly in a very uh, large meteorite called the Murchison meteorite, which landed in Australia. Tons of amino acids, but no life, as far as we know. I think that's another astrobiology question, isn't it? <laughs> if, ooh, <laughs> I was going to say, if anybody is actually interested in coming and working and, and learning about uh, uh, meteorites and, and other aspects of planetary science, I've got a, uh, a set of flyers here for our planetary science degree. 
um, which is planetary science with astronomy. Um, so we actually make you go and you know, do, do a bit of hard physics in the astronomy side. And then the planetary science is, is looking at other planets and looking at meteorites and so on. Anyway, sorry, there were... Mm -hmm. and if I'm memory serves me right, the Hoba is a, a very large me uh, iron meteorite, and iron meteorites stick together far better than than um, stony meteorites. So, yeah, and the, and the, yes, I mean the, the the Hoba meteorite you couldn't possibly move. Um, there are others that are you know sort of still quite big and were very difficult. There was one in the um, Natural History Museum, the Cranbourne meteorite, which um, they had to take out one of the, the uh, windows to get it in. And then it's still sitting where they left it. I mean, they built a thing around it. Uh, but it's now in a completely different exhibition, which has absolutely nothing to do with meteorites. <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it, it, I think it... I don't think it tells us very much about the asteroids because the problem is you've got a big asteroid there, say, you know, say 100 kilometers diameter. And in order to get a meteorite, you've got to have an impact which ejects material. So there's very little relationship between the ejected material and the, and the body that it's come from in terms of size, much more relationship to what's hit it. Yes, because obviously a small impact or a low velocity impact will not release much material, but a large impact will release a lot. So, you know, you, that's, that's basically the... Uh, that Most of the big ones are all iron, yeah, they're all, they're all iron meteorites. Yes, that would be the Cape York one, I should think. Yeah. Is there another question there? Ah, yes, that's, a, yes. The most likely reason is that very early in the solar system history, we had a couple of uh, radioactive isotopes that are what we call short-lived isotopes. And uh, they were formed at the, before the solar system uh, accreted, uh, but they were still active. And one of them is an isotope of aluminium, one is an isotope of iron. Now, those two, uh, iron and aluminium, are quite uh, iron in the uh, iron in the metal and aluminium in the in the minerals in this uh, particularly uh, silicate minerals. Um, they probably provided a lot of heat, and so that would have heated up the uh, the asteroid, the planetesimal, as we'd call it at that stage, uh, until it began to differentiate. And the ones that haven't differentiated, heated up and turned into uh, layers, they probably accreted a bit late. And if you accrete too late, if you're, then you don't, although you have all the, the material there, you can't get it to melt. It's like having all the ingredients for the cake. And if you're quick enough, you can get the cake in the oven and get the cake out. But otherwise, if you're too late, the oven's off, you can't make a cake out of just the raw ingredients, you do need to have the heat. So it's it's that that's really the reason. Um, so yes, yeah. It's a bunch of geologists. They want to go for a, uh, the drinks. So. <laughs> There's a variety of compositions depending on depending on what uh, what meteorites you're looking at. There's a variety of compositions, and in fact, in the meteorites that we've been looking at, the these olivine rich ones, um, there is quite a wide variety. Uh, each each meteorite is is one one composition, but when you look at all the meteorites together, you realise there's a there's a much there's a very wide compositional range. So it's it's um, I think you should come to comets, asteroids, and meteorites next term. <laughs> okay, I think we'll yep. call for questions to an end there. There'll be a chance to talk to Hilary, I think, in BO2, just down the corridor on the right. At 7 o'clock, Rick Cooper will be talking about the complexities of nuclear behaviour, and tomorrow there are various sessions on careers in science. Please check out the Science Week website.
But I'd like to thank Hilary again for a fascinating talk. Thank you.